That's the most challenging phrase in our text for today. Coming in Matthew chapter 26, we're going to start today, really our overall text begins at verse 36 and goes through verse 56. But probably the most challenging part of that entire text is this reality of not my will, but thine. Or not my will, but your will, Father, as some translations will put it. And so as we're, as we're going to step and look at this text today, I want us to understand that the message of today is that Jesus surrendered Himself for us to surrender ourselves. His surrendering of Himself, his, Him giving of Himself, was to be met or is to be met by us surrendering ourselves. So, as we go ahead and open, as we begin our text today, I want you to have this in mind as you're, as you're turning in your Bible to Matthew 26. I have a question for you, and this is, this is kind of my opening question. I always try to have one for you. Uh, what do you do when people let you down? What do you do when people let you down? What's your reaction? What's your, what's your emotion? Now I'm going to give you a, I'm going to play out a story for you for a moment, and I want you to answer the story, but as a teenager, my father and my mother both had this line whenever I did something that was disappointing. And I don't know if you used it. I don't know if you heard it. But it's, I'm not angry. I'm just... Boy, every one of you knew it, didn't you? Every one of you knew it. I'm not angry or I'm not upset. I'm just disappointed. Ouch. Boy, that's, that's worse. It's like I'd much rather be angry. Whip me, spank me, do something to me, but don't just be disappointed. But what do you do when people let you down? And I realize that oftentimes when people let us down, it's because we're disappointed too, or it's when we become disappointed. I realize that the surrender narrative that happens in this passage is a narrative really that provides us the Gospel. It shows us more about who Jesus is and about His response to when people let Him down. And the objective of looking at Jesus is that we can learn as well how to respond when people let us down. Now, maybe I'll have to work on myself because I like the phrase, I'm disappointed. But I'll have to change that. Let's go ahead and start for a moment. As we're looking at verse 36 and really in following, actually I want us to jump down to about verses 47 and following. That's where we're going we're to start there. We'll kind of do some jumping in today. This narr- the entire narrative of this passage is where Jesus goes and prays in the garden. He then is betrayed by Judas. And finally, He surrenders Himself. So that's kind of the, the flow of our passage But if you're looking down in about verses 47, 48, we're actually going to read verses 48 and 49. This is where we see first off that Jesus is surrendered by a fraud. This is where Judas has come in. And if you're looking back at verse 47, it says, while Jesus was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve with them, with a great crowd. Swords were drawn and clubs. Verse 48. Now the betrayer, that's Judas, Judas, this is verse 48. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and he said, greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And I look at this moment in that situation. Jesus has already expressed in the beginning of our text, verse 37, 38, That his soul is just grieving in pain because of what he knows is ahead. And as he is in this moment of grief, knowing what's ahead, this is the fruition. We spent a little time last week talking about Judas and this idea that Judas really wasn't even wholeheartedly committed at this point in his life. 
At this point, the, the, the persuasion that I left you with, and it's yours to choose or to, to reject, was this idea that maybe Judas was only in it for the money. That by this point, maybe, maybe he started with a genuine goodness, but the idea of theft, the idea of stealing, those qualities are things that never left him. And because of that, at this point, when Jesus lets Mary break that expensive perfume over him, that Judas sees money more than he sees the anointing. And so this is the opportunity. This is the straw that broke the camel's back where now he is gone and he is going to do everything possible to go ahead and get rid of Jesus. Or maybe he's trying to force Jesus' hand. Maybe he wants Jesus to go ahead and do what Jesus is going to do. But I think more so Judas is convinced that money is the solution to his problems. He looks at all of the other things, and I think that by this point, Judas sees money as the solution to his problem, so he sells them out. He tells, them, he tells the crowd that's with him, he said, you're going to know the man that you're going after. I find that interesting, because I think, first off, I'm like, well, surely everyone knew Jesus, right? Surely everybody knew Jesus. But they didn't. Even as popular as he was, they still needed a sign to know exactly who they were going after. They didn't all know what he looked like or what he sounded like. They wouldn't have known by looking at the crowd even who they were looking for. And so Judas says, he says, I know him. I know him well enough that I could pick him out of a crowd. I could walk up to him. I could kiss him. I could do everything outwardly to make it look like I love him and like I'm devoted to him. And by my outward devotion, you will know who to get. I realize sometimes in the surrendering process, we might only be surrendering our outside. Maybe we're only surrendering what goes on outside of us, but maybe the inside has yet to be surrendered. In some of our lives, in some of our situations, it's easy to act out the part. We use a phrase sometimes, fake it till you make it. And sometimes we, we live by this idea that if I can just do the outward stuff long enough, hard enough, passionately enough, that maybe my insides will change. And you know what? Sometimes it does. But here's an account where Judas uses the outward sign of devotion and love in a way that are not showing the inside of a true, devoted, loving person. And I question, are there times that maybe I do the same? Where it's easy for me to look the part on the outside, but for the inside to be rotten, spoiled. Is it easy for you? Are there times for you where the outside feels zealous for God? Where the outside, where, where our calendars can become so full of church stuff, of good stuff, of things where we would say, Lord, didn't, didn't I feed you? Or didn't, didn't I clothe people who were homeless? Didn't I feed the hungry? Didn't, didn't I do all that? But yet in Matthew 25, Jesus talking to the same crowd of folks who were saying, Lord, we did these things, still makes the comment, depart from me. I never knew you. Is it possible that Judas here shows the person who has surrendered the outside but hasn't surrendered the inside. I want us to focus on another group of, of individuals in this story. I'm going to call them the friends. Jesus is now surrendered by His friends. First, He was surrendered by a fraud and now He's surrendered by, by His friends. There's a couple of passages that I see in this moment that build us to this idea First off, I want to jump back into the prayer portion, which is the beginning, verses 36. I want to emphasize verse 40 and 41 for a moment. This is Matthew 26, verse 40. Jesus has told the disciples, we're going into the garden to pray. He leaves some of the disciples, and then He takes Peter, Andrew, and John, and He goes on further, and He says, I want you to pray. 
And then he goes in a little further for him to pray. And this is verse 40. He came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. Now let me just be completely honest here. Anyone fall asleep praying? Okay, no one's raising your hand, but I trust you. I heard enough uh uh-huhs. Look, I have fallen asleep praying. I don't know how many times. When I'm righteous, I try to wake up and say, oh yeah, well... Okay, Lord, thank you. Amen. You know, I try to make it right on the back end of it, but let's just be honest. Sometimes late at nighttime, about 10 o'clock for Josh Watkins, about 10 o'clock, it becomes impossible to stay up much longer. Oh, man. It's tough. I look at these disciples and I want to make fun of them. I want to ridicule them because I say, come on guys, you're out in the middle of of a garden. Surely you could have stayed up with Jesus for a little while longer. But then I think, if I were in their shoes, would I have done any different? Man, talk about a nice cool grass. Probably kind of a cool crisp night in the air. Maybe, Maybe there's some coyotes off in the distance that are kind of making some howls. It's dark. Stars are twinkling, and I can imagine maybe laying my head back. And then the dreams begin. Verse 40, Jesus came back and He found them sleeping. And Jesus says, watch and pray that you will not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So He goes off at this point, Jesus does. He leaves them again to go and pray. And this is now we're jumping down to verse 43. And He comes again, this is the second time, and He found them doing what? Sleeping for what? Y'all ever had that happen? Boy, Josh starts talking. His voice. Oh, he just turns that, that good monotone voice on and those eyes, they just... Oh, I get it. I get it. Man, I'm out, I'm out under the stars right now with Jesus and I'm thinking, whoo, these eyes, they are hard to keep open. I don't have my coffee. I've been up all day. There's probably a crying baby somewhere at nighttime. Mm. Their eyes were heavy. So Jesus leaves again and He goes and He prays again. And He comes back the third time. And Jesus knows what's happening. And at this point, He looks to the disciples and He says, it's time. It's happening. Grab your go bags and let's go. The next time that we see the disciples, I believe, surrender Jesus, I believe they surrender Jesus over, is at the very end of our text today. This is verse 56. But all this had taken place that the Scripture of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then, all the disciples what? Fled, left Him, deserted Him. Mind you, right before this, Peter had pulled his sword out to defend Jesus. He, he, pulled a, his, he pulled his glock from his waistband and he was prepared to take on whatever enemy came into the building. He was prepared for that and Jesus stops him. And at this point, we see Peter, and I'm sure there's probably some other disciples who are ready to die for Jesus. They're ready to go to fight. But when Jesus says that's not the way this is going to happen, They run. They flee. They surrender Jesus. They're no longer with Him. How hurtful do you think that was to Jesus? You're standing with 11 of your best friends. Most of us probably don't even aren't fortunate enough to have 11 best friends. Now mind you, Jesus had 12 of them and one of them just kissed him. So there went one of them. He has 11 other best friends. One of them just pulled a sword and was willing to go I mean he was willing to go to blows for this guy. 
and they all run like cowards. I feel alone now. I feel, for me, I feel puzzled. I feel, ha, ha, we've been three years together. We've, we've eaten in each other's homes. We've slept in the same rooms. We've, we've done everything together. I've, I've moved mountains in your presence. I've brought people back from the dead in your presence. And yet, your reaction to a crowd is to run? How earthly, how worldly, how, how little your thinking is. That's what, that's what I want to see in this moment. But I don't see that happening. And I'll tell you why I think I don't see that happening. It's because how often do I still run and flee in my life today? You know, every time that someone calls me to stand up for my faith and I do not stand up for my faith, I have fled, I've run. When people confront and they say that Christianity is a hoax because of A, B, or C, and I deny the opportunity to stand up and to say, no, my faith is legitimate. My belief is real. When, when I fail to do those things, am I not yet again surrendering Jesus to whoever? Or what about the times when, when peer pressure, when the people that I'm around, when it's, when it's work or school, the peer pressure of the moment says this is the thing that you should do to be accepted by society. These are the things you need to do so that other people will see you, so they will validate you, so you'll be important. And yet I, instead of standing with my faith, my conviction, my belief, I say no, I'm going to give on these things so that I can be accepted favored and regarded by society. When I choose to do things that may even... I'm not even saying wrong yet. When I choose to do things that are not defending my faith. But let's switch it to where I do things that I know are wrong. That I know I shouldn't do. And don't act like you don't do that. Because I know every one of us has our pet sin, whatever it may be, where we know we shouldn't do it, but yet we do it. And in those moments, we are yet again surrendering God, surrendering Jesus for our own sake. It's what do I want and not what does Jesus want for me? What is the will of the Father in those moments? How many times do I leave Jesus? Maybe because I'm just too tired. Or I just want to leave Him. In my time of leaving Jesus, He gives me an example. In the times that I disappoint Him, in the times when He has every right to look at me and said, Josh, I'm not angry. I'm not mad. And the times when he should say, I'm disappointed. Do you know what he does? He issues forgiveness. And he hands himself over in those <coughs> moments. You see, when the crowd shows up, down here really in verses 47, Jesus hands himself over. He surrenders Himself. This is verse 53. Do you think that I cannot appeal to My Father and that He will at once send Me more than twelve legions of angels? We sang the song just a moment ago. Do we, do we believe it? And Jesus is making this comment. This is His comment to Peter when Peter's pulled out His sword. But He's making this comment that... that if you really believe if protection is what I needed, I'm more protected than the president. I could, I could call upon God and He would solve the problem. But that's not what Jesus did. Amen and thank you for that. Because what would have happened had Jesus called 10,000 angels at this moment? I'd still be just as lost. 
You see, if Jesus had taken his own will, he would have done exactly probably the same thing I would have done because he would have said, well, wait a second. I want this cup to pass from me. That's his will. But then what does he end the sentence with? Not my will. Roger was saying, not my will, but yours. He was surrendering himself to the will of the Father. So I'm saying this is the self-surrender moment where Jesus in this moment says, God, I give myself to you as the sacrifice. Whatever it is that's needed, I give it to you. And on the behalf of these people who are heartless, who are faithless, who are cowardless, on the behalf of these people who do not have a passion for you like I do, I give myself to you in their place. When we were cowardless, faithless, helpless, Christ gave Himself as the surrender for you so that we could become His righteousness what we're told. Father, not. This is verse 39. My Father, if it be possible, let the cup pass from me. But not my will, but what you will. And his second prayer, this is verse 42. My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. When we fail to surrender our lives to God, when we fail to surrender, Jesus' response is not a response of I'm disappointed in you. I'm unhappy with you. And I am so thankful that, that, that His model of parenting, His model of friendship, His model of life is so much better than what mine is. Man, you wrong me a couple of times. I cut you off. I'm not, you know, what, what's the phrase? It's fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice. Or, Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. There we go. I got it backwards. Y'all knew I was saying that. Boy, I, I, can be, I can be duped a couple of times. And I'm, I'm even gullible. I'll be duped a couple more times. But man, I like to cut it off at some point. I say, I've been hurt enough. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm so thankful that Jesus' response is not my response. Because when I fail to surrender my life to Him, His solution is not to say, I'm going to cut you off, Josh. You got seven times, bud, and then you're done. Straight to hell. That's not that. He says, I still forgive. I still want to welcome you in. I still want to hold you close. I still want you to be valued and important. And So Jesus, instead of being disappointed in me, says, I surrender myself, Josh. I surrender myself for your betterment, for your behalf. Surrender is a tough word. It really kind of comes from more of the battle scene, a war. But it implies the idea of giving up. The idea of surrender is that I have given up my own abilities to whoever I surrender to. I will lay down my arms, my sword, my gun, my whatever. I'll give it all up. And I will agree on the terms that I'll no, I will fight no more. But I give my life to whoever the victor is. That's what happens when a general surrenders. They sit down and they say, these are the things that we're going to do so that I can preserve life. And the call that Jesus issues for us in His example of surrender is that we too would surrender our lives. That we would set down our arms. That we would stop the fighting. And that we would give our lives wholly to His will. You know, without a doubt, there are different levels of surrender. Some of you today have never surrendered your will to God. There is someone here who has held passionately to what they want. And if you're that person, I'm going to ask you to look at Jesus very closely. 
and to start to see what his life is like and what he surrenders. And the blessings that come from a life surrendered to God. But some of us have surrendered our lives and maybe we've pulled things back. Maybe we haven't kept the terms of our surrender. Maybe we like to control still some things while letting Jesus control others. There are times of greater surrender in the Christian life. And when we give more, it seems we fall more in love with who Jesus is. When we surrender more, we fill ourselves more with the Spirit by God's gift. And it seems like our worship becomes a little easier, our passion a little fuller, and our love a little deeper. Romans chapter 6, verse 13, I think is a wonderful verse for us to close. Because God demands us to surrender our entire selves to Him. He wants you completely. He doesn't want just part of you. He doesn't want just your eyes. He wants your mouth. He wants your ears, your hands, your heart, and your mind. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments of righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we come before You knowing that in this life there are things we have not surrendered. Knowing that in this life There are moments that we hold to ourselves. Father, we know that Your call is for all of us to be given to You. Father, for those here today who have not committed their lives to You, Father, may You use Your Word, Your Spirit, and others to show the joy that comes in a life that's given to You. The reality that, that we are tools created by You for Your purpose. And when we are used improperly, it gives itself to a poor life. But that a life lived in Your glory is a life filled with fullness and joy. Help us to show that in every step of our life. And Father, for those here who have committed their lives to You, who have willingly died to themselves in the waters of baptism and have been raised in a life that is spiritual, Father, help us to truly sacrifice ourselves for the prayer of Jesus to be our prayer. Not what I want, but Father, what You want. May this prayer fill each of us and may You be glorified in our lives. These things we ask in the blessed name of Jesus the one who surrendered it all. Amen.